All right, so I'm presenting today on enough statistics so that Zed won't yell at you. Okay, my name is Devlin Daly. So actually, I contacted Zed about this talk and I asked him if I'm going to present this, is it really going to be enough so that you won't yell at somebody? <laughs> and he said, no, probably not. But you can try. So we're going to try today. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Some caveats. I am not a statistician at all. Okay. I'm actually into digital identity. So if you guys want to talk about OpenID, OAuth, SRP, some permissions, anything later on, I'm going to talk to you about that. But I've taken a few classes on statistics, and Pat wrote me into this, and it's all Pat's fault. Okay. So some of the things I'm trying to do today with the presentation is to familiarize some of you with some of the vocabulary with statistics and just some of the basic concepts. Okay, so the basic concept of why statistics came about is because of models. Okay, so models should be pretty familiar to us because software itself is a model. Okay, so there's different models of how the planets um, orbit the sun, you know, in elliptical orbits. Um, now, they're mathematical models, so they're not actually real life. That doesn't mean that they're not useful. And okay, sometimes they can be very useful. Okay. Um, so statistics came about is because they would have these equations describing the motion of the planets, but the data didn't actually fit the model perfectly. There was always this error function. And it was always off a little bit. So the statistics is actually the study of that error of a model. Okay. So for instance, if I ask you, what is the temperature of the human body? Okay, so this isn't actually just one number because that temperature is going to vary. Okay, so we say, well, it's about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and but we'll see. Well, it's distributed. So this is the standard normal distribution that we're all used to, the bell curve. So the things that we can learn from this, can you see my pointer? Good. Is that uh, the 98.6 would be right here at the at the average. Right? So that's the center of this distribution. And then if we measured it, then it's going to be a little bit more, a little bit less all the time, a little bit of randomness all the time. But in with the normal distribution, then we can tell with the area underneath the curve um, how much of the data is how close to the mean. So these are standard deviations. So within one standard deviation of the mean minus and one plus, we expect about 68% of the data will fall within that range. And if we extend that to two standard deviations, then we'll expect to see 95% of all the data within that range. So that doesn't mean that all data is going to be in there, but on average, uh, we'll see about 95% of it. Okay. So uh, this is the the normal distribution, but when we go to measure something, it's not always a perfect normal distribution, but it is a distribution. And so distributions are characterized by well, where where the middle is, which is usually the average or a mean or some metric of middle and then how spread out they are. And that's the standard deviation is, is the spread. Okay? So to kind of explain a little bit more the, um, the play between the two is here's two different samples. We got the blue and the orange. And um, these two distributions have the exact same average, except one varies great a bit quite a bit more is that there's a lot more spread in the, in the data values in, in the orange. So for instance, if this was a web server, then we say if we were just looking at the averages, then we say, oh, well, the performance is the same because they have the exact same average. But uh, with one, since it's varying greatly, then we know that something is seriously wrong with our web server and we need to investigate it. Okay? So coming back to the finding the temperature for the human body, is that in order to find the true average temperature, so now we're talking average, so there's not a single temperature, it's a distribution, and to find that true distribution or the true average, we would actually have to measure everyone in the world. Okay? So that's what we call population. So if we're going to do of all the human race, or if we were looking for the, the average for everyone in this room, we would have to test everyone in the room and get their measurement. Okay? So if we're looking about the world, then this is something that's not even possible. You know, so, um, or even what's the average weight of, of an elephant? There's no way you could actually weigh all the elephants in the world. Okay? So what you have to do is you can't actually measure the population directly or exhaustively, so you have to sample it. And all a sample is that we take a subset of the population 
and then we use that to estimate the, the main population. Okay, so the population is the thing that we actually want to measure, and the sample is, is what we can feasibly measure. Okay? But this sample needs to be representative of, of the population or we're going to get completely bogus data. So, uh, for instance, if we're looking at, at the average height of people and the sample was my family, then I'm short for my family. I'm 6'2". And so we would conclude that everyone in the world is around 6'6". Six, six. Okay. So that's totally bogus. So we need to make sure that our sample is representative if we're going to try and infer it back onto a population. Okay. So I'm going to get into a little bit of statistics of comparison. But before we get into that, we just need to know that the sampling is a key part of, of statistics and that we need to have good samples and that is how we manufacture good data. That's the only way that we know what actually is truly going on. Okay, so one run of any benchmark or any test is not a distribution, that's a single data point. Okay, we need to have multiple samples so that we can see the variance in the samples and to be able to identify the distribution. All right, uh, I work for Phil Windley. I think a lot of you may know him by reputation. Um, one thing you might not know about him is that he loves Diet Coke. I don't, he, he runs a conference and he makes sure that there's always five times as much Diet Coke as any other beverage because he loves Diet Coke and he's not going to run out, okay, Eat for breakfast every day. So, um, so let's say that we have Diet Coke and we want to know, can he really tell the difference between Diet Coke and Coca-Cola Zero? Can he tell the difference, okay? So we need to, how can we design this experiment to actually find that out? Okay, so if we think about it, like, well, we could give him one of each. So if we let him taste a cup, you know, we're not gonna have a label, of course, then he's gonna pick either Diet Coke or the other. And then the second one, well, it has to be the opposite. So he actually has a, he has a 50-50 shot of just guessing that right. So that's not very good. So, that, so if we give him just two cups, then we don't know if he's just guessing or if he, got, or if he actually can't tell the difference. Okay, so we could give him two of each. So he has a 50-50 shot on the first pair and a 50-50 shot on the second pair. So to get it absolutely right, he has a 25% chance of just guessing it correctly if he can't tell the difference. Okay, so it looks like we're onto something here. Uh, you know, if we give him enough cups, he's not very likely to actually get lucky. There's a slight problem with this approach is what if he really can tell and he just makes a mistake? Okay, so it's a model and, and he's going to make an error, either human error or he, he meant to say one and didn't the other. Okay, so what we could do is instead is we just get a huge sample size and we randomize which one he, which one he drinks, and then, and then we, uh, we would stop and say, if we gave him that huge sample size, we would assume, well, what if he can't tell the difference between the two, and he's just guessing? Is what would we expect to see? Well, we'd expect that probably on average, if he's just guessing, he's gonna get half right, just by chance, just by luck, okay? So if you can tell the difference, we would expect that proportion to be much higher than 50%. So this is actually called a z-test. So you can go look that up if you want the actual mathematical formula and how you would, you'd go and execute it. But the point is, is that we're comparing two things. We're comparing the proportion of if he was just guessing to the proportion of what he actually gets right. So this is, statistics is also has a, a logical framework for testing. So, and they have structure to them, these statistical tests. So these tests typically compare two models and you start with a hypothesis that you assume to be true. Okay, and we call this the null hypothesis. Okay, so in this case, we, the null hypothesis would be he can't tell the difference. Okay, and so the null hypothesis would say, well, he's gonna get about 50% right. So then we look to see if the data supports an alternative hypothesis, okay? And in this case, it's, well, he can tell the difference between the two, okay? Now, the thing to realize about this test is with statistics, it doesn't prove anything, and it doesn't tell you which one of these models is right. It just tells you which one is better for the data that you've gathered. And it actually gets a little bit more subtle than that is with the null hypothesis, you never actually accept one of the models, is that you, 
either reject it or you fail to reject it, okay? Because we don't know if there's a different model that would actually be better than both of them, so, okay? So this is just one of the tools we need to apply it in the right, at the right time and only under the right circumstances. So an example of this would be A-B testing, okay? So let's say I have a site and I sell stuff and at this site I have visitors coming in and a certain percentage of those visitors become customers. So that's a proportion. We call it the conversion rate of a website or an advertising campaign. So let's say that I come up with a sweet new website, the new hotness. It's just great and I know it's going to be good, but how do I actually know that it's any better than my old site? Okay. So how would we go about testing that? So the, well, the conversion rate's a proportion, and so it's exactly the same as, as the Diet Coke example. Okay, so we would actually have to, in our advertising, is we need a representative sample. And so we would need to make sure that it's representative, is we would just pick them at random, whether or not they get to go to the new site or if they go to the old site. Okay, and random is because that's the best, is, it's the best that we can do to get a representative sample. Okay, so then we would send people to the, to the new site and then we would compare the conversion rates. Okay? So, now there, there are a few caveats of this. I had a friend that uh, they ruled out an, a new website and, um, and, so, and so they did exactly this. They had an ad and they sent a certain percentage of the, of the traffic over there and they found out that um, the new site wasn't doing as good. It was actually doing worse. So they went looking and they discovered that um, the new site was broken for IE6, that they were using JavaScript to put something in your shopping cart. And so if you're using IE6, you actually could not purchase anything on the site. <laughs> this is really bad, right? So then the question is, is well, so um, is, is that accounting for why it's worse? And so, and, and you can do that because you can just look at the proportion. So you can just take the proportion of IE6 users and take them out of the sample and then compare the old site to the, you know, to the new proportion minus the IE6 users and to see if, if it was your site or if it was the design completely or if it was just that you made that error that you quickly fixed. Okay. So that's a Z test to proportion test. All right. So let's say that we want to sample for a benchmark instead. Okay, so um, say we have a web application, and the thing we actually want to measure with web application is how many requests can we do per second? So a good tool to use for this is HTTP perf, that we're going to generate a test load on our web application, and we're going to send requests one, at, one right after the other as fast as it possibly can go. So to sample this, is, so that's kind of the population, so we need to sample out of that, so what HTTP perf does is that you would pick every, is it every five seconds. For a given second, you count how many requests you actually got during that second. Okay, so this is an example of all the requests. These are the X's. And then at the start of the red X right here, this was the start of the second. And then we counted how many requests we got during that second. And then the next second, well, we're not sampling it. Okay, so we're actually sending through, um, you know, in this, in this test we might send through 10,000 web requests that'll take about 30 seconds, but we're actually only going to pull out maybe four samples from that out of that population, okay? So of course, you know, our favorite uh, web application, well, web server for Ruby applications is Mongrel. So uh, a little bit small up there, but you know, is this Mongrel and how many do we need to have? I mean, so... Uh, So let's see here. Run! Run! Jump! Jump! Rest! Rest! Now I know we've had a rough day, but I'm sure we can put all that behind us. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, the mongrels is kind of a free for all. They're not lined up, you know, they're just going as fast as they can go. So we actually need a pack of mongrels pulling our dog sled here. Okay, so what we did is we, we, we're going to measure the performance. Uh, the request per second, and then we're going to make a change. Okay, so we're going to change, like we're going to add caching to our application or something. And we're going to see, well, did it actually, we made that change, is the performance changed at all? Okay? So in this case, it's not a proportion, so we can't use the previous Z test, and so we need a new tool. 
We need the t test. Yeah, we need the t test. Okay. So the basic premise of a t test is that so we have this population and we have these samples. And so the t test says, okay, I have two samples and they're estimates of the population since we can't measure it directly. And so the t test will say will tell us the assumption for a t test, the null hypothesis is that these two samples came from the same distribution. So basically this means, the assumption is that there is no change. Okay? And so with the, with the uh, t-test, the output of the t-test, the most important part is called a p-value. So p-value is the probability that the effect that we're seeing was just caused by randomness and not by our change. Okay, so the t-test is actually just a, uh, it's a approximation of the permutation test permutation test just looks at all possible combinations in a population and to find out which ones are as bad or worse than the ones that we saw. And they just count up, um, you know, what, what the probability was that we just grabbed those at random and we ended up with something as bad as we did. Okay? So, a quick example here might help. This is R. It's an open source statistics analysis program is pretty, pretty good. It's pretty hardcore though. Okay, so uh, for instance, um, say we have the numbers, uh, one we can ask uh, R to give us the documentation on, you know, what is the t-test, okay? So one thing, um, you know, to keep it really simple is, let's say that we have a, we sample something and we have uh, the numbers one through ten, and we want to see if, you know, the numbers 7 through 20, um, if those are from the same population. So we can just run a t-test. Um, so this is a, called a two-sample t-test. So I'm just going to um, 1 through 10 and then 7 through 20. Okay, that is small. Okay, can we read that better? Okay, so the important parts here is, um, is this p-value. We see this is an extremely small number. So that means that if we assume that these two samples came from the same distribution and then we just randomly pick two samples from it, that we would have, you know, a chance in, what is that, a couple million that we would end up with something that bad. So then in that case then we say, well, that's not very probable then. So we would reject the null hypothesis that the means that they're from the same population, we say, yeah, these are from two different populations. Okay? So before I showed the, the graph of the average and the standard deviation and then they, they can be the same. So let me just recreate that. So I've got A is just going to be, uh, I'm going to sample from a random normal distribution. So you give me 100 samples uh, with a mean of 30 and a standard deviation of 1. Okay, so A, um, is now in that distribution randomly, randomly selected from a normal distribution. And let's put B as uh, 100 samples, again with this exact same average. Let's give it a quite a bit larger uh, standard deviation. So it's going to vary quite a bit more. Okay? So this is the exact is that, that graph I had. So if we test these, then we find out that um, the p-value is, you know, is 0.2. So we've got a one in five chance. See, so these distributions actually overlap quite a bit. So then we would say, well, actually, there's there isn't a whole lot of evidence that they're from different populations, and they're most likely from the same one. So then we would say that there is no change at all, and they're from the same population, even if one's a little bit faster than the other. Well, it could be just due to randomness. Okay. So the t-test gives us, uh, you know, we got two samples and we say, are they any different? So like in a performance test, let's say we compare two runs and on one run I use my Mac, I'm um, using a Core 2 Duo processor with three gigs of RAM and for my other test I'm going to use Linux, an AMD processor and four gigs of RAM. Okay. So say I do those two runs and I run through my t-test, Tisa says, yes, there is a difference between these two samples but then the question is, is the t-test only tells you that there's a difference, it doesn't tell you what the difference, what caused the difference. And so this is called confounding variables. 
So the only thing that you can do to combat confounding variables is basically you only change one thing at a time. You keep everything the same and then you only change one thing. And then so that if you isolate it and there's only one thing, then that's the only way that you can have confidence that the thing that you changed is actually the cause of the difference. Okay, so there's been um, um, a, co a common trend, I guess. I, I saw a benchmarking test where, you know, to do it right, you, you don't want your, your testing code to, to infringe on um, the actual application performance, so you really need two computers. Right, you need one computer to be the client, you need another computer to be the server, so that the client isn't stealing the CPU away from the web application. And so uh, one fellow had the idea, like, well, you know, I don't really have two computers, but uh, Amazon has the elastic computing grid, and they get a virtualized server with these specifications, so, and that's pretty standardized, so uh, it's been kind of common to do um, performance testing using Amazon EC2 which is an awful, awful idea. And it's because, uh, well, it's virtualized. So there's multiple hosts per actual physical box, and you have no control over um, how many are on there. You just ask for one, and you're assigned randomly, basically, to one of these servers. So you, you don't know if the benchmark is changed because of the application code, the thing that you're testing, or if it's due to the virtualization environment, or that you just really got unlucky and you're on a really busy host. Okay, so to, for a benchmark, then that, that, there's too many confounding variables. You don't know what is causing a difference, if there is any. But then on the other hand, if you are deploying your application to Amazon EC2, then that's something you have to put up with. So then you would, you would test your application. You would have to have enough samples that you would find an average um, so that instead of looking at the performance of this, of the specific application, it's this application on Amazon EC2. Is how you'd have to do that. All right. So in review, we got a few tools now. We got the uh, the Z test, the test proportions, and we can use that for it like A/B testing. We also have the T test to see if two samples are from the same population or not. So some of the takeaways is uh, you know sometimes we we change something we think you know that's going to be faster, but you know my gut tells me, but but if you really think something's better, is how do you actually know it's better if you haven't measured it? Okay, so and with statistics, it's, it's really easy to make mistakes. That's why it's really important that we, we have someone double check us, you know, some peer review. Uh, there's some really subtle problems that we may overlook. Even statisticians, when, when they're working on things, they, they always collaborate with other statisticians because it's so easy to make mistakes. And so uh, a good way of doing that is, is to automate your test harness that's actually driving your test so that, you know, it's always the same. And one of the nice byproducts of that is that then it makes your test easily replicated by someone else, so then they can peer review it. So I'm sure we all know of a really handy, cool language we can script tests with. Um, and, uh, and to automate our, grafting, our, our graphing as well. So when we come back. So some uh, resources is uh, the R project. Uh, again, it's uh, open source, runs on multiple platforms. Uh, it's great for st statistical analysis. Um, these guys are hardcore. They got great documentation. A lot of the documentation is assumed that you understand all the statistic principles. But as soon as you get some of the lingo down, then you can kind of uh, figure it out, and Wikipedia's your friend. Okay, uh, another excellent resource is on Peep Code. Uh, they have a, an episode on benchmarking with HTTP perf. And it is actually quite excellent, where he actually goes through a Rails application, and he tests the performance of it, and then he compares that with, uh, with purely dynamic, with page caching, and then with act action caching. So he's not specifically using a, a t-test in, um, in that peep code. Um, he actually just looks at uh, standard deviations, um, which is actually the exact same thing as a t-test. He just doesn't run the function. He just does it with an intuitive proof. But it is, it's quite excellent, especially his description of how you would sample um, an application. And of course, Zed Shaw. Um, uh, probably familiar with his rant on programmers need to learn statistics or he'll kill them. Um, which is, it's a, good, it's a good rant for identifying some of the common misconceptions uh, that we have, uh, you know, at times, you know, the compounding variables. We should never measure how many users can this system um, handle, because how do you measure that? What is a user? It doesn't make any sense. You actually need to go straight for performance, so like request per second, and don't bother with, with users. That's a meaningless metric. 
Um, also, uh, fantastic resources. His write-up when he was doing some Rudy, Rudy, Ruby, Odium, and uh, and Lucene for text searching. And this that is a, actually a fantastic write-up that that he did, um, and that he actually steps through the entire process of how he bootstrapped the analysis, how he um, sampled. Uh, the test to, to find out how many samples he actually needed to run. He has on there all of the, the data and the testing harnesses and all of his analysis scripts with explanations of why he did everything. It's a fantastic write-up. Um, also, kind of key here to statistics um, is, is just dealing with the data itself and to uh, find meaning from a graphical representation. So, of course, Edward Tufte um, is fantastic for that. I highly recommend the visual display of quantitative information and how you can convey information through um, you know, um, quantitative in information through graphs and such. Alrighty, any questiones? Hope not. So. What, what, do you, what do you need in terms of sample size to be like a representative sample? Like, do you need sample two seconds over the course of like is that how? Okay, so the question was, um, how many samples do you need to know that you're representative? What well, makes a representative sample? Um, well, representative sample is, um, what I mean by that is, is you can't, like, um, you can't take a sample of convenience, right? So if I'm going to find out what's the average height of people in the world, then a, a non-representative sample would be just what's convenient, like, people in my immediate vicinity. Okay, so the best way we, so it's really hard to manufacture representative samples, especially if you're not sure what you're measuring. So the best you can do is to randomize it. And so if you randomly select out of that population, then on average, if you keep, and you do several of those samples, then those samples will be representative. So like you have a run of, say, several minutes, you pick two seconds, is that enough? I mean, one second, how is enough? Is two enough? Three? Um, it depends on what you're measuring. So usually, like, if you're doing a, a run for performance, then you would, um, you're going to take a sample, and out of that sample, you're going to calculate a, a, an average for that sample. And then you're going to look at sample averages. So there's the central limit theorem, which means that uh, the things that we're going to measure aren't normally distributed. But the normal distribution is really easy to work with. But it turns out if you're looking at um, you know, there's the raw data of the sample, and if you look at a mean, or it's called a statistic, so a parameter is a, a population like the average weight of an elephant, that's a population, and so the average is called a parameter. And out of that sample, if we take an average of the sample, that's called a statistic. So any statistic that you um, are taking the average of, that if you have enough samples that, that um, those averages will end up being a normal distribution regardless of what the original distribution was. And that magic number is about 30. So if you get about 30 samples and you're looking at the mean, then you're good to go. So are you saying that if you take two samples such that the average of each sample is the same, you've got a good representative sample? No. Um, Population of Utah, how many are men and how many are women? If you take this room, you're not going to get a very good sample. But if you met more convenient for us, that's right. Because right. uh -huh. so your question again was, can you ask me the answer? Sure. The, the question was, if you take two random samples uh, and you're not sure what size would, would constitute uh, a good random sample, if the average of each of those two samples is you know, it's close to each other, does that indicate that you've got a good No, not, not necessarily, because they could completely have a chance. Um, so th there's uh, a whole branch of statistics called, like, uh, the power test. So the power test is, say, I want to be able to make a decision at the end of this with, like, a 95% confidence that I'm right. And so then you, you would say, okay, what's, what's my population? What are the basic estimates of those parameters and it tells you how many samples you would actually need to have. Uh, can you address the difference between a random sample distribution and a uniform distribution, for example? Um, what do you mean? That, well, random is, it, there's some relationship between randomness of data and uniformness of distribution of that random data. 
if you're randomly selecting samples of the population, you may not be getting some, a uniform representative sample set. That, that's true. Um, it, it, is, it, is there anything you can do to clean your data to make sure that the, this, the statistical population is represented by your Well, um, you definitely have to make sure that you have good, clean data to start out with. Now, I guess I was a little bit confused because uniform distribution is actually something very specific, and it doesn't follow a bell curve. It's just a straight line is uniform distribution. But I, th I think your question is, is, say I have a population and I grab randomly out of it, I could randomly pick a really bad section of it. Is that right? Yeah. So the, only, the way to mitigate that is that the random selection for the sample is that it's not a one-time, it's not a one-time deal. So you say, on, if we select randomly, that on average, if we keep repeating the test, that on average, it'll, it'll even out. So one time we could get a really good one, one time we get a really bad one, and on the average, we're going to get a fairly representative sample. So it's not just a one-time shot. You have to, that's why you have to have multiple, sample, multiple samples from a population. Does that answer your question? Well, it begins to. It, it seems like when you're testing software, there's all sorts of crazy artifacts that can deal with the age degree and you know, latency versus you know, certain maybe a periodic behavior. And it could just be that the randomness of, of your sampling happens to fall. If, if the, you know, the, the, the speed with which you can sample data completely misses the flips that always fall between the spaces where you're doing that. So is there, are there techniques for discovery that you have just like crazy outliers? Like, like you said, the IV6 thing. Yeah. Where, like, oh, we're just not getting any, any data from that. Um, or, or is that just more of an art than science at that point? It, it, it is an art, really. Um, so, I mean, the only thing that you can do is, is that those artifacts, is, and if you randomly sample, is that eventually if you have enough samples that you're going to see some of that funky behavior. So, you know, it's possible that you're never going to see it if you're randomly sampling, but that's really unlikely. It has a really low probability for that. So, so it's like the size of your error bar. You said, okay, we, we know that there's this many data points in, yes. in this population, but we only only sample you know, X percent of them. So that means our error bar is a certain size. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. You go with that. Yeah. Gets more refined, but then you have to take it. That, that's a tool for discovering those, but then that might be able to discover the outliers. But the statistics isn't going to tell you whether those outliers were just by chance or if it's actually a problem with the system. And so that's why it turns over to you have to understand the underlying causes of the system. And statistics is just, it's actually a really, um, it's not a very insightful tool. It's a powerful tool in the right context, but it, it's not this all knowing thing. Really, you use it as a tool for your specific domain knowledge. Um, with Bayesian uh, statistics, you can find stuff like causality. Has anyone ever tried to aim that at HT curve or anything like that? Okay, so the question was is uh, with, uh, with Bayesian methods and statistics, then. Um, it's a way of defining causation, and if anyone has used that in HTTP perf, um, small nitpick, uh, Bayesian statistics cannot prove causation. Okay, so what a Bayesian does is it uh, uses a probability model. Um, it, it's an inverse um, probability. So it's basically like um, I deal you a, from a deck of cards, I do five cards, and depending on the five cards I got, then I can estimate the prior probability whether or not the deck was shuffled or not. Okay, so it's an inverse probability, it's a reverse one. Um, so Bayesian methods are, are, are very cool. I don't, I don't know if they've been applied to HTTP perf or not. Um, some, um, that's actually something to ask Zed about, because uh, when, I, when I ran into Zed, um, I was taking my stats course, and I was like, uh, and I asked him a question, and he was explaining some nuances of the t-test, and then he's like, have you looked at Bayesian statistics? And um, I had used Bayesian statistics for like uh, machine learning classifiers, but uh, I didn't know that you could actually use it as a general purpose statistical tool, and I just actually found out about that last week of how you actually use it. So, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't. This sounds interesting, sounds really cool. So, I'm wondering with HTTP 
infer specifically, you know, why, why would you use a sampling method when you could actually measure the entire population? I'm just trying to remember. You can measure the entire population? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a statistician. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so the question was is, uh, with issue here, why do you even sample if you can look at the full population? So I know that um, sometimes you can do the full population, but you have to realize that too when you're doing a performance benchmark, so you're looking at a specific time interval, so that's not the actual population anyway. It's just that segment of a population for a given time interval, which is a sample. Right, because you can't actually measure you know, the performance of all time. Um, the other thing that I know about is um, part of it is just with, um, um, with the sampling then, um, part of it is computation. Not that that's really that awful. I'm sorry, I need, I need to ask Zed on that one. I'm not, <laughs> I don't have a good answer for you, I'm sorry. So, you have an answer? I'd like it. Basically, a lot of times when you're doing statistics, you're, you're making decisions on things that don't exist yet. So like your, your, your website is not in production, and you just want to see you know, which web server can we use, or what OS should we use, or how much RAM, or whatever. So you, you basically set up a bunch of scenarios, and every scenario you run the tests on. And they're not real production data you don't have. is that if, if you look at the full population, then you get, you have one distribution. Where if you have samples, then each one of those samples is its own distribution. And so that gives you a lot more powerful tools to analyze it. But that was a great answer. I wish I would have come up with it. Okay. Thank you much.